Hello everyone, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Omar, I'm one of the residents at Mayo Clinic Arizona in internal medicine of course. Um, I obviously want to first commend Adnan for doing all this. It definitely is a pretty valuable contribution when you look at this whole process and essentially our journey through medicine and how peer support guidance will uh, form the foundation of everything we learn, everything we do going forward. So good job, Adnan, and you know I appreciate your efforts. Let me start with screen sharing. Okay, can you guys see this? Can you guys perfect. see them? Awesome, perfect. So when Adnan reached out, um, you know, obviously we uh, brainstormed what we would want to talk about and what uh, he would want me to talk about. And I feel like it was pretty um, relevant and appropriate that I take you guys through my journey and generally the journey uh, from med school to US residency and obviously shedding some light on internal medicine specifically as a specialty These are my contact um, Details you guys can reach out to me on email Twitter YouTube anywhere um, You know, I'm more than happy to provide guidance in any way um, Needed, you know, whether uh, regarding med school regarding US residency and you know onwards I have a YouTube channel uh, which I started essentially before I started residency and I realized it was a platform to for me to be able to share guide and share advice on a much larger scale you know um, I'm always happy to give more personalized guidance one-on-one -on -one, but I realized YouTube um, you know was a good platform uh, for that use and I have you know uh, made several videos obviously within the constraints of residency training uh, sometimes it gets pretty busy things slow down on YouTube but I try making videos regularly on a lot of different topics um, especially this past residency match you know it started off with uh, how to create your personal statement application whatnot interviews how do you rank programs and really stuff like that basically so I hope this is beneficial. You guys can you know check it out, see what the videos are. If you have any recommendations for any specific videos, you can always reach out and let me know. And I truly hope it just is beneficial to you guys. The first few videos are very detailed, um, taking you through uh, you know my journey through med school, matching uh, you know to residency at Mayo Clinic and so on. And they will give you a very deep insight into you know what my journey through med school was. Okay, now all of us have very unique journeys. You know, everyone has a different path that they take in life and different chapters in life that uh, get them where they want to be. And, you know, I have a journey of my own. So I kind of put a few pictures here to sum that up, starting from the top left. Um, I'm originally from Kashmir, India. I was born in Hafuf in Saudi Arabia. Um, and then went back to Kashmir, which is this, obviously the snowy picture here. Um, I lived there for seven years until class 10th. And then uh, class 10th, I went to Malaysia for my high school. Um, I kind of switched from CBSC to uh, the UK system of IGCSEs and A-levels. Finished that, then started looking for you know medical school options. Uh, eventually went back to Saudi, uh, to Riyadh. And did my med school there and you know after uh, I was done with that I then applied to the US residency um, obviously doing my US MLEs while I was in uh, med school and eventually matching at Mayo Clinic in Arizona as you can see here it's a valley it gets hot in the summers but has beautiful winters and it's just a pretty uh, nice and up-and-coming city now, med school experience, 
I, as I said, I went to Al Faisal University in Riyadh, and this on the right side is our affiliated hospital where we did our clinical years at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. And I like telling people that everyone will shape their own med school experience. You know, two people in the same med school can have very different trajectories, can have very different journeys through med school. And that is, I think, important to understand. The med school will provide you with the basic framework of um, what you should be learning, what you should be doing, but there's so much more room to tailor your med school experience to your needs, to your goals, to what you plan to do in the future and so on. And I think that was the case for me as well. You know, obviously many of my batch mates in med school, uh, we all did many different things, you know, ended up going to different places for residency, different specialties and so on. So I think the key point is that you will shape your med school experience. Now, how do you make the most of med school? Obviously, you know, this is um, advice based on my personal experience and really a few key tips out of so many other things anyone will advise you to do. Uh, but, you know, when I talk about uh, making the most of med school, there are a few uh, points I mention. The first one being that plan early, set goals and have a timeline. And the reason for that is, you know, if you have a vision early on in med school, you might be in first year or second year, and you at least have a rough idea of what you want to do. You don't, you don't need to know the specifics and, you know, the very precise specifics, but a general plan of how you want your med school experience to uh, pan out and what you want to do after med school, it helps. It helps to plan. It helps to pursue opportunities early on that will benefit you, you know, going forward. And let's say if any of you are interested in pursuing the U.S. residency uh, pathway, you want to ask yourself, when do I need to be done with USMLE step one? When should I be doing step two? Okay, and then I'll have to do some clinical rotations in the U.S. after that. So just having a rough timeline in mind really helps. The second point would be seek opportunities. And quite often they won't be spoon fed to you. As I mentioned, you know, med students are such a huge group of people all over the world and they they train in different settings they have different opportunities available to them but truly there is no limit to how far you can reach out for assistance for help uh, in terms of seeking opportunities that think will benefit you and this includes research opportunities networking opportunities uh, post medical school graduation opportunities like research, um, fellowships, uh, clinical rotations, and so on. So reach out and seek opportunities. Do not wait for those opportunities to come to you because you will, you know, if you follow that, you will probably miss out on a lot of different opportunities that you could have benefited from if you only reached out. The third point I want to make is, um, you know, you medical school is exhausting. It's a lot of studying agreed but another aspect of med school is truly growing as a person and because i feel if someone graduates from med school not having grown as a person their qualities their personality skills they did not really make the most of med school so how you can do that is by volunteering volunteering in different events happening at your med school uh, community service volunteering um, find opportunities to lead teams, be a leader, you know, uh, start initiatives. If there's something that's missing at your med school, see how you can get things started on that. And, you know, in the process, you will grow as a person and it will reflect uh, in a lot of things that you will be doing as you graduate from med school, as you continue with further training, wherever you go. These skills are something you will carry, you know, into your career going forward. Having said all this, I have to emphasize, take care of yourself. You know, this cannot be emphasized enough. I understand that in a lot of places, especially in our countries like India and other places, uh, there may not be much of a concept of wellness or taking care of yourself or managing burnout or fatigue. But I can tell you, especially if you're planning to come to the U.S. for residency, it's a big deal here. You know, there are very strict laws with regards to working hours, um, Residency programs want to ensure that their residents are taking care of themselves, they're spending time with their family, they have hobbies and interests outside of work that they can pursue, you know, to have some um, free time or leisurely time. So things like these will be important. Stick to your hobbies, you know, give your hobbies time, give your interests time because our hobbies, interests, our passions, 
these are things that truly make us who we are, right? In in a in a lot a lot of different ways, basically, it gives us our personality, and it will always come up when you're doing interviews for residency, and they want to know, okay, you know, what are your hobbies? What kind of person are you? So do not ignore that side of you. At the end, med school with all its difficulties and challenges will be uh, an experience you will not forget. You know, you will down the line, you will look back at your med school experience and really be nostalgic about all these times you spent with your friends, with your batch mates and made a lot of memories. And truly that's how anyone should look back, um, you know, at med school uh, with. Okay. Now, talking about picking a specialty, um, a lot of you guys going through medical college, you must be in that mindset. Oh my God, what am I going to be doing after med school? You know, what specialty fits me? And it neither has to be like the spin of a wheel where you just, you know, base it on luck, nor does it have to be overly stressful. Um, it comes with time uh, for many people. Some people have it sorted out much earlier. Some people take some time. But you want to reflect on, you know, your uh, cl clinical year experiences. You'll be doing rotations in the hospital in different specialties. See how they went. See, did you feel connected with any particular specialty? And, uh, you know, does a lifestyle uh, attract you? Do you think, you know, down the line, uh, you see yourself working in that specialty for dec for, for the next several decades, right? Um, so these are the things to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, people have different inclinations, whether they want to do medical specialties, surgical specialties. Um, you may relate to your personal qualities and characteristics uh, and make a decision about your specialty based on that as well. Talk to your mentors, talk to your seniors and, you know, your faculty. Uh, see what they have to say, get a better insight into those different specialties you're interested in, and then eventually, you know, plan. And as I said, you know, some people sought this out much earlier than others, um, but, you know, everyone has a different timeline, everyone has a different journey, so do not stress out. You might see some of your colleagues, some of your classmates have everything sorted out, they know exactly what they want to be doing, but that should not freak you out, you know, just take your time, explore the specialties. Believe me, even in the U.S., a lot of people even up until, uh, you know, after finishing residency, they still are unsure what they want to do after that in terms of subspecialty. And that's perfectly fine. You know, you can take your time. But the point is, it may be something you will uh, give some thought to, you know, enjoy the process, enjoy the experience of exploring these different specialties and then make a decision eventually based on your own preferences. Now, uh, Adnan uh, had brought up the point of talking about internal medicine specifically in this webinar and that's what we I'll be touching on really very superficially. So when you talk about specialties in medicine generally, you have two big categories. You have um, the, inter the, the medicine specialties and then you have the surgical specialties, right? For example, in the medicine specialties, you get internal medicine, you get uh, pediatrics, you get uh, family medicine, psychiatry, and neurology. And in the surgical specialties, you will get, let's say, ob you'll get vascular surgery, colorectal surgery, general surgery, and so on. So internal medicine obviously falls under the medicine, the larger medicine category, and internal medicine is definitely one of the very large categories of um, the medical subspec uh, medical specialties because there is just so many different uh, subspecialties that fall under internal medicine and you know just an insight why is it called internal medicine it, that's because the internal essentially refers to um, the pathophysiological processes that might be going on that internists or internal medicine physicians have to uh, you know, take into consideration when treating patients. There's a lot of critical thinking. There's a lot of, uh, you know, looking into differentials, what diagnostics to send. And truly, that's what I love about internal medicine. You know, it is very engaging. And I truly feel that I'm very confident that I made the right choice uh, in terms of how it fit me, how it fit my personality and my qualities. 
and what I was expecting from mental medicine is exactly what I see it uh, is so that's really internal medicine on the next slide this is a long list of you know different subspecialties that come under internal medicine as you can see you go from cardiology gastro infectious disease nephrology pulmonology rheumatology and then in fact after internal medicine residency some people just do not specialize any further they just work as internists right or hospitalists that we uh, call it so hospitalists are basically internal medicine physicians who work in the inpatient setting and then we have internal medicine physicians who work in the outpatient setting in the clinic in primary care so truly that's the beauty of internal medicine is just so broad it offers so many different options in terms of future career pathways and and that is the reason why internal medicine is just also very popular among uh, IMGs or foreign graduates who pursue residency in the US. Now the next thing I'm going to be doing, now we've spoken about med school, we've spoken about internal medicine, the next thing I want to do is give you a very uh, comprehensive overview of US medical residency. Um, some of you guys might have looked into it already, Some for some of you it may be new, but I want to give you just like a quick overview of you know what is residency training in the US and what kind of factors go into it what the overall structure looks like so before we do that there are a few terms you want to be familiar with so any one of you looking into US residency there are a few terms that will come up like very frequently obviously the first one being USMLE or the United States Medical Licensing Exam you know which includes the step one step two step three I see a, uh, a misuse of the USMLE term, uh, especially you know in India. I see that people refer to the US residency as USMLE. So when someone says, I want to do USMLE, they may be referring to the residency, but USMLE truly just means the exams. So the whole pathway, the journey of coming to the US for residency is not USMLE, you know, uh, to be precise. IMG means an international medical graduate or an FMG. This is basically anyone who has graduated from medical school outside of the US. And then you will hear the term the match. Oh, is the match coming up? When are the match results? The match is truly the process uh, through which people get accepted into US residency. And the reason why it's called the match is because just the way it's set up, there's an algorithm in place where the applicants who apply to residency, they will, uh, towards the end of the process, rank their programs. The programs will rank their applicants, and then they will be matched using an algorithm in place, right? So that's why it's called the match. And then we have NRMP, uh, is the National Resident Matching Program. It is basically the overall authority that oversees the match. ECFMG is the Education Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. For any IMG, they need to be certified by ACFMG as part of applying to the residency. Um, and so they're the ones who deal with that. ERAS is the Electronic uh, Residency Application Service. It's basically the portal, the online system through which people apply for residency. Uh, that includes, you know, uploading your documents, putting up all the information on the uh, portal and the, the, the good thing about it is you can apply to like so many different programs through the same portal 100 200 300 programs through the same portal you don't have to apply to individual programs separately and then LOR an LOR is a letter of recommendation <clears throat> basically these are the letters you get from US faculty other faculty to submit with your ERS application for residency and then we have USCE or very general terms means US clinical experience and you know that that is a totally different discussion in itself as to what different types of uh, clinical experience we have and then intern now in India and many other countries internship means that last year of medical school right uh, that we do but here an intern means a year one resident so that is a very important detail to keep in mind, especially when you're applying to uh, electives or clinical rotations in the US. If you tell them that you're an intern, uh, they might get confused. They're like, if you're, if you're already an intern, which means a first year resident, why are you applying to clinical rotations? So 
that is something you want to keep in mind. If you ever bring that uh, term up, you want to explain uh, to whoever you're talking to. It could be in interviews. You could say, oh, yes, as part of medical school, we have the last year of med school, which is an internship, which is kind of like a semi-residency, right? But you're still a med student in internship. Now, um, as I mentioned, you know, basically residency is post uh, medical school, like graduate medical education. The duration obviously varies from specialty to specialty. Internal medicine is three years, neurosurgery is, you know, like six or seven years. And what does the process generally look like? So you have the ECFMG certification in the beginning, then you submit your application through ERAS, then you do interviews. Um, eventually, you prepare the rank list, as I was saying, the preference list uh, based on the programs you interviewed at, and then you wait for the match results. What kind of factors go into determining the success or the chances of someone matching? Obviously, USMLEs, um, letters of recommendation, personal statement, uh, your grades in the clerkship uh, of the specialty you're applying in, let's say they would be interested in seeing what was your score in internal medicine in med school, right? Um, and there's this MSPE, which is a medical school performance evaluation. It's like a short letter by your dean, which kind of summarizes your med school experience. Obviously, there is some consideration for year of graduation. The preference is to uh, have fresh graduates, right? Um, and those who may have several years um, post-graduation, uh, they may be asked, like, why did they take those several gap years after medical school uh, before applying to residency and what were, what they were doing type of visa you know if you go deeper into this discussion about U u.s residency you'll realize that there are different options for visas j1 h1 uh, um, some people do not need, need a visa who are u.s you know green card holders or citizens a uh, number of attempts in the u.s family someone did not pass the first time that is looked at that's taken into consideration and obviously clinical experience in the US. Now I'm going to be sharing some statistics with you guys and all this is from uh, the NRMP. As we said, the NRMP is the authority that oversees the match process and every year after the match they release uh, data about the match on their website. I have the website in the references and it's very good information to go through because it kind of helps you plan as well and kind of see what things look like. And you can look uh, at your specific specialties of interest. You can see what the mean step one score was for the applicants who matched and did not match. Step two score, clinical experiences, volunteering, how many did they have? Kind of helps you plan as well. So here's a graph that looks at the trend over the years in terms of the total number of applicants and the total number of residency positions, right? For example, for this past year, 2021 match, there were 42,500 applica applicants who applied for the available 35,000 or almost 36,000 residency positions. You'll notice that it doesn't sound like a bad number. I know in India, the ratio is extreme. It's like there are far fewer spots than the number of people applying. So you can see that in US, the ratio is still, it's, it's a decent ratio, honestly. But if you look at the graph, you'll see that, you know, over the past few decades, the positions available haven't really kept up with the number of applicants applying, right? But you can see that the positions have also tried going up to keep up with the increasing number of applicants and the increasing number and the increasing demand for physicians in the country. Here's another graph uh, from the data booklet that they share. It, this is basically looking at the different kinds of applicants based on different specialties, right? You can see the applicant type is like MD senior, MD graduate, DO is doctor of osteopathic medicine. It's again like a different uh, route of medicine in the US. And then US IMG, non US IMG, and so on. I just want to compare two examples, internal medicine and neurosurgery. If you look at internal medicine, a huge number of positions available, 9,000 positions. And if you see out of that, uh, about you know 3,400 were filled by IMGs, um, US IMGs and non-US IMGs. And truly the number of positions 
practically reflect the, the need for those physicians in the country, right? And obviously there's a big need for family physicians, for internal medicine physicians all around the country. But on the other hand, if you look at neurosurgery, you'll see the total number of available positions is just 234. Because that's, first of all, they don't need 9,000 neurosurgeons in the country. And that's what kind of drives the competition in those many of those surgical specialties, right? So you have 234 positions. And how many of those were filled by IMGs? 17 positions were filled by IMGs. So certainly not as many IMGs who matched there, but there were still IMGs who matched in neurosurgery, right? So if someone tells you, oh, forget about you know, applying to a surgical specialty for U.S. residency, it's not possible. That is not true. I wouldn't say it's not uh, possible. It is possible. It requires additional work. It's much more competitive, obviously, as you can see by the numbers, but it is possible. Some more data here. Now these are factors. So besides the other survey I showed you or the other data booklet I showed you, the NRMP also surveys the program directors of the residency programs. So they send them a survey and they ask them, hey, what kind of factors did you as a program director take into consideration when you were selecting applicants for interviews or even ranking them? And this is the data from that. These basically responses from program directors. On the left is basically the percentage of the program directors who said, yes, we take this factor into consideration. And you can see that obviously step one score like 86%, MSP is the medical school evaluation, step two score, uh, the grades in the clerkships, um, and uh, you know all other factors basically. And then you, uh, the, on, the, on the right side is basically the importance rating. So they were told to rate the importance of each of these factors out of five, right? So you can see that, you know, USMLE step one was like 3.7. And that is interesting because I think more recently now the score is becoming less important because now step one is pass fail. But if you look at other things like any failed attempt at USMLE is 4.4. Um, and let's say medical school accreditation status, obviously they would want to it seems like they take that very seriously, obviously. The med school is accredited and so on. Some more uh, data on the same uh, thing. So this time, this is personal characteristics. Before it was academic characteristics, right? So here, what do they like looking at? So letters of recommendation, 85% of the program directors look at that. Personal statement, 84%. Uh, perceived commitment to specialty or the interest in the specialty and so on leadership qualities and on the right side basically uh, how important were those uh, factors so professionalism and ethics 4.5 letters of recommendation 4.2 perceived commitment to specialty or how interested is this person in the specialty 4.3 okay So generally, that was an overview of U.S. residency, of med school, my journey, and basically internal medicine. Uh, I obviously want to give plenty of time for questions. There are usually always questions, and the questions really help open up the conversation, and I wanted this to be more of a conversation. Um, this is one reference I have, and besides that, I am more than happy to take any questions you guys may have. Again, my contact details if you want to, you know, ask questions that way. But I would obviously love to have a conversation and answer any questions you guys may have right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bakal. So uh, the questions uh, you guys can put up uh, in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and uh, one of the questions that I had was, uh, how did you select your uh, specialty? That's a good question. I probably should have touched on that. <clears throat> I think, um, you know, I was in med school and I feel like, again, it was really my uh, clinical rotation or the clerkship that we do as part of our clinical uh, years, right? Um, I had a very positive uh, experience in my internal medicine clerkship. 
um, our clerkship director was very involved in our academics and he truly helped to build that um, sense of critical thinking, thinking about differentials and made me kind of interested in, in, in internal medicine. You know, up until that point, I didn't really have a deep insight into internal medicine, but as did my clerkship, I got more interested. I worked in the different specialties and I started uh, getting involved in uh, cardiology research in my fifth year. And, you know, truly the direction started from there, basically. And then, you know, you have role models in your family, in your social um, circles. And I had many. And I felt that I would be happy in internal medicine, you know, given my personal qualities, my personal and how I see myself progress over the years. What kind of career do I want to see myself involved in? I, with all honesty, did not connect with uh, surgery. The OR did not feel like a place I was happy at. I just felt like I was pretty restricted in terms of, you know, scrubbing uh, in and covering yourself up. Um, I felt like whenever I interact, whatever I do, I like expressing myself as the person I am, right? Uh, but I feel like I had very limited opportunity to do that in the OR. Uh, I respect everything the surgeons do, but I feel like that really wasn't uh, what I thought was best for me. So, yeah, I think, again, it goes back to the clinical rotations that I did, spoke to the physicians uh, when I was on my clerkships and got their insight as to what they feel about internal medicine and just had a good experience. Yeah, okay. So we have uh, three questions in the chat box. So uh, the first one is uh, Anahita has asked, uh, she asked about the duration of different residency specialties. Yeah, so, you know, this is information you'll probably get more detail about online. Um, it can vary, as I said. Um, usually it's, you know, three years for internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics. I think neurology is also three years. Psychiatry is also three years. And then the surgical subspecialties are usually more. I think ob is like five years. Neurosurgery, seven years. Um, general surgery, I believe, is five years, and then you can do something else after that as well. So, you know, that's the general trend. So medic medical specialties, shorter, surgical, more. And that's also because many people who do medical specialties, then they do a further subspecialty, right, which we call a fellowship. So, for example, someone wa who wants to uh, do cardiology, they'll be doing three years of internal medicine and then three more years of cardiology. And then if they want to further specialize like interventional cardiology or electrophysiology or heart failure, they will do one, two years more after that. So, you know, it all varies. Yeah, okay. So, uh, the next one, okay. Will Rohit has asked, will step two CK will also be pass or fail exam in upcoming years just like step one? It's a good question. Honestly, first of all, no one knows, you know, what they will do. But my... Uh, prediction or my assessment is unlikely. I do not think they will make a CK pass fail. And the reason why, if you look at the reason why they made step one pass fail is because based on the data they were getting, they were seeing that the score in step one wasn't necessarily correlating with the performance of those residents in residency. So like, then they started thinking, why are we giving step one that much importance, right? So if it's not correlating it doesn't so a high step one score does not necessarily mean a good resident so we shouldn't really be giving it that much value and i think that's one reason that drove this change in uh, step one ck on the other hand is a much more clinically oriented exam and you know probably correlates better with how residents do in residency and if they take that off they, they they'll be far less things, uh, objective things that they have to compare applicants, right? So I feel like for now, for the next few years, the trend will be that the CK will become much more important. So I feel like for applicants, what they can do is, you know, just study reasonably well, give the step one, and then truly do quite well on your CK. I think that will definitely help your application. But yeah, for me, I think that CK will probably stay scored for the next few years. And uh, so Tanishka has asked, what according to you is the best possible time to take step one? That's a good question, honestly. And I will say, first of all, everyone's timeline is different. And I'll tell you how. Um, if you go by the U.S. system, the U.S. medical students, obviously their, their, their MD program is four years. And keep in mind, by MD, I mean medical school, right? Because here they call 
like MBBS is MD here. So here, medical students, they do the step one after two years of medical school. So after the first two years, they do step one, and then they have two more years of medical school. And that's basically, they do step one after their preclinical year, because they have two preclinical years, right? Now, if you have a five-year program, that would roughly equate to doing the step one after three years, right? Because, you know, in my medical school, I had three years of preclinical and then two years of clinical. So, uh, you know, people would say, okay, if you want to equate, it would be right after the third year. But honestly, that doesn't really work uh, for most people, if not all. There are very few people, very, very few people from my med school who did like step one after the third year. Um, I personally did step one in my internship. So I started studying early internship. I gave it by the mid of internship. It was a very tight uh, timeline that I was pursuing because so I did, you know, my step one in uh, August and then I started studying for my CK. I gave my CK in December. Oh, no, no, sorry, my bad. So I gave my step one in December and then I studied for CK, gave it in August. And then September, I did my clinical elective in the US and I, in October, I applied for the match. So it was very tight. And you don't have to do that. You know, the recommendation is try to get done step one as early as possible. So you can, um, you know, study for CK, give it more time in your clinical years and you're not, uh, you're not squeezed when you want to do electives let's say someone wants to do many electives they want to do three four five six electives but one of the limiting factors becomes um having to do ck because a lot of people uh, haven't done ck by the time they're they want to do electives so with now step one being pass fail i think it will be more likely for people to be able to give it earlier so you could give it let's say uh, after your third year maybe in your fourth year because if you do that then it allows you to do your ck in your fifth year end of fifth year beginning of internship that way you can leave let's say the second half of your internship for u.s electives right u.s rotations and you don't have to worry about studying for an exam you can be fully focused on your rotations you can perform your best and go you know in that direction so again depending on how things work out for you what your other commitments are everyone has a different journey so some batchmates that i had they did step on earlier than me some did later than me so everyone has a different timeline as if you want to apply to the match right away after medical school, you will have to do it a bit early, right? Because many people, they take a gap year, maybe two gap years after medical school, and then they apply to the match. That's a totally different um, scenario. Then in that case, you can just do your steps after med school, after you finish med school. But if you want to apply to residency right after med school, as soon as you graduate, then you would have to do your steps earlier. So loosely, you know, do your step one aim for after third year, maybe in your fourth year, end of fourth year, and then giving your CK maybe end of fifth year, early internship. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, Mahima has asked, uh, how did you build your CV and what is something you did different which helped you to match? It's a good question. Um, uh, you know, so basically, I speak in very good detail about my CV on my YouTube video about, you know, what I did in med school. I talk about all the different kind of experiences that I had. What I can tell you is to match at a very good or like one of the bigger programs in the U.S. academic programs who have like, you know, um, which is a university affiliated programs, basically. Generally, there is a more and more of a push to review applicants holistically so now programs want more holistic applicants in the past you know someone with very high step scores and nothing else they would match in good programs but now things have changed now there's a bit of a shift away from step scores to making sure that the applicants are more holistic right so what does that even mean so obviously step scores are one thing being involved in academics and research that's one more thing find opportunities for publications publish a few papers uh, present a few posters at conferences um, volunteering experiences in med school i think that was one of my strengths as well because there were some things many things actually that i did as part of med school that expressed my interest in 
academics, in cardiology, in medicine. And for example, there were some things that also highlighted, uh, you know, leadership skills. So I was leading certain programs, clinical training programs, research training programs in med school, through which we send applicants or our students to the U.S. to different hospitals like Mayo, Cleveland, Harvard, Brown, Yale, for research in the summer, right? And we, as students, would be the ones organizing all that. We would communicate with the programs. You know, we would have a budget. We would allot that to different uh, students. And we had an eligibility criteria in place. We would interview students and it was a pretty rigorous process. So that kind of demonstrated that I had certain qualities like leadership or time management, teamwork. So if you have volunteering experiences on your CV that demonstrate those skills, that someone reading your uh, CV can go like, oh, okay, so this person did those experiences and they seem to demonstrate those skills, that will benefit you. So if you want to get involved in anything in medical school, think about how it benefits you you know what benefit does it have for you in the long run and what does it tell about you all my experiences were like more than one year long so i didn't used to i just wasn't a big fan of like volunteering for certain events for one two days all my positions so all my volunteering was really just positions on you know student committees right and those one year two year long uh, positions and i feel like that maybe also uh, helped so these are two things. And then obviously, you know, doing well in your interviews, being confident, um, you know, a, a lot of us, we are very shy coming to a new system. It can be very uh, uh, tense or like nerve wracking in some sense, but you want to be confident. All of you guys have so many different skills, so many qualities, so many strengths and so, so many unique things that you bring to the system. So you want to demonstrate that you want to be confident about your skills. You know, when I was doing my elective here, one of my uh, attendings told me, hmm, you're very confident for an IMG. So it's like, you know, the general notion seems to be that IMGs are not confident or they're kind of shy. Um, and that shouldn't be the case. I think we have a lot to offer. And, you know, confidence is very important throughout this process. So that's one more thing. Then obviously there's the personal statement, making sure it's well written, polished, without errors. Your application, your ERAS application is, you know, uh, well organized. Uh, ranking programs, applying to, uh, applying broadly. When you initially apply, make sure you apply to a large number of programs, and then after your interviews, you can rank them accordingly. So you know, believe me, like there was, there was no magic recipe. To be honest, what I was able to do, any one of you can do that. Um, I think you want to do your part in trying to get there while seeking help, seeking assistance, learning from others and doing your best. That should be the focus. You know, sometimes there are obstacles, there are difficulties that come in the way. But as long as you've given it your best, that's all that matters, really. That is, that is wonderful. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> Sondaria uh, has asked, how did you make it to uh, Mayo? What made you stand out of, uh, stand out of other applicants? about that so honestly to be honest as i said i think i answered this question with what i just mentioned yeah but truly there was no magic recipe um being holistic just aim to be holistic do not only focus on step scores or usmles be holistic grow as a person demonstrate that you have skills you have experiences that show that you're a very well-rounded person um, and connections will be important as you go through the journey. Many of you from your med school, maybe who massed into residency, stay connected with them and reach out to people basically. So networking is also very important. And I always recommend medical students to join LinkedIn and just, you know, just communicate and interact with other people. You might find research opportunities there. You might find, um, uh, clinical experience opportunities there. So LinkedIn is also very good for networking. The answer is yes. I mean, a lot of IMGs do clinical electives, clinical rotations here. They don't have IELTS or actually TOEFL is the US version of IELTS because IELTS is UK. They don't have step one and they're able to do rotations. 
So I think the vast majority do not require those things. It's just those very few specific ones that require step one. For example, Mayo Clinic requires step one, uh, Cleveland Clinic requires step one, and TOEFL, of course. But, you know, COVID kind of complicated the situation in terms of um, clinical experiences. Before people were able to get, you know, clinical electives a bit more easily, uh, easier than, you know, uh, since when COVID has started. But the key is to explore what options are available because they keep, you know, suspending and resuming. So I really don't know what the most recent is on clinical rotations. But what I can tell you is there are definitely a lot of opportunity for clinical electives. Aim for big academic hospitals like Mayo, Cleveland. If that's not possible, look at other hospitals. See what, what other big hospitals are offering electives who do not require those things. And then if these are not available, then look for uh, smaller medical centers. If those are not available, then look for private practices. My rule of thumb is anything is better than nothing. So if you can get some US clinical experience, you can get um, letters of recommendation from the US, that generally should be enough for you to be able to match, you know, once you do your steps and everything like that. Um, yeah, that's generally uh, what I would want to say. Yeah, so basically, again, as I said, uh, it will vary from person to person. Um, I wish I knew in more depth about, uh, you know, uh, Indian uh, students and how they go about things. But I've noticed that a lot of people also do it after graduation. You know, they must have graduated from med school, then they're doing PG in India, but then they kind of think about U.S. residency and then they do U.S. MLAs and then they go to the U.S. Now, clerkships is a very specific term. Clerkships basically are those rotations that you do as a medical student in uh, the US and clerkships are something that go into your transcript into your medical school transcript so yeah broadly you can say clerkships but I'd say you know the general term is clinical electives or clinical rotations basically but I do understand what you mean and for that as I said there are certain rotations which will need you to be an active medical student like Mayo Cleveland you can only apply to these electives if you're a current medical student. But once you graduated, things change because you know laws change and what you're eligible to do changes. Uh, because you know if you're graduated, you have your degree, means you're a doctor, means you need to be licensed to do anything medical here. So that's why then you know then there's that avenue for observerships, externships, and stuff like that after graduation. But if you want to do electives before your graduation in internship you know I previously had heard that in India it's very difficult to get do internship uh, months outside but maybe some medical colleges offer that or allow for that for you to do some months of your internship outside so that would be the perfect case scenario and that's how you can apply to those uh, electives that require you to be a, a current medical student right so yeah Devarajan uh, has asked, how should a first year medical student like me approach volunteering and other extra things that I can do to be more experienced starting from the first couple of years of med school? Good question. Um, so really, I think when you start med school, it's going to be a big change. You're going to come, you're coming from like, you know, school to medical school and it will be an adjustment. So the first, for the first six months, even the first year, take it easy, you know, just focus on uh, picking up those skills you need for medical school, you're learning your academic uh, skills or strategies, how do you want to go about your exams and how do you want to learn the content and generally just enjoy uh, in the sense that take it easy, uh, have a plan in mind but you know you can first kind of step into medical school, become comfortable and then you can start doing stuff, right? You don't want to overwhelm yourself. But as I said uh, from early on, you could identify things. You can do things you enjoy. The best case scenario is you are doing volunteering stuff that you enjoy and that also tells a lot about you and your skills. So you might enjoy, let's say, um, organizing events. And you might be organizing events that are like community-based or about healthcare awareness. You're raising healthcare awareness through um, awareness campaigns. 
So that is like a plus plus, right? You're doing stuff you're enjoying and then you're also doing something medical or clinically relevant and which demonstrates that you have a passion for medicine and obviously organizing such events takes ma many different skills. It needs you to have communication skills, teamwork skills, leadership skills, management skills. And so basically activities that demonstrate or highlight many different qualities about you that you can talk about in your residency interviews, these are the things you should be pursuing. But community service also is very well respected. You know, you could be going out to the community doing free health camps. These are also very good experiences. Has asked a question, I guess she has been answered. She asked about the extracurriculars like volunteering, uh, research, and holding positions in organizations to match in the US. So you pretty much uh, went over that. Yeah, I'll just say that look, people. Some people may match without any of this. Someone may have no volunteering, no research. Uh, but just step scores and good interviews, uh, good, you know, well-organized person statement uh, application, they may match. Someone may not match despite having all these things. So it's so difficult to tell, you know, what factors, uh, you know, the interplay is very complicated. So the point is to give yourself the best opportunity. Try checking all, all, like as many boxes as you can, basically, right? So get some volunteering, get some research. Holding positions in organizations, you know, man, I'm, I don't think that is as much uh, valued, but I'd say between those two, if you say volunteering versus research, I would probably say research because research seems to have a growing importance in terms of getting publications, in terms of showing, uh, you know, uh, past experience. Now, if you are asking if you need to come to the US to do research, I know many IMGs come to Mayo for research and other places for research after graduation. No, that is not needed. That's not necessary. You know, as you can show that you have some publications, some poster presentations, even from India, that should be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Anahita asked that she wanted to ask about the disadvantages of living in the USA, the lon loneliness or things like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, every place has disadvantages, literally, like any country you go to, any place you live in, there will be disadvantages, right? But it's always a balance of pros and cons, like what am I getting um, versus what am I losing, right? So uh, let's talk about, let's, let's talk about the advantages first. Um, you know, I'm married, my wife is here with me. Uh, my family is in Saudi, you know, they're not in the U.S. So it, that is a disadvantage if I were to mention that first. You know, it's obviously difficult to uh, visit them as frequently. Uh, in residency, you get limited amount of, um, you know, vacation time. So obviously you stay connected over the phone and stuff, but that distance can be a bit difficult initially to adjust to. But, um, uh, you know, in the long run, you eventually adapt somehow. So being away from, you know, your friends, family, uh, back in India or you know wherever you are uh, that can be a bit difficult to adjust to but what I can say is in a lot of places in the US especially you know a lot of IMGs they do residency in New York on the East Coast such a diverse community US generally is incredibly diverse so you want to keep that in mind so anywhere you go you'll find a strong Indian community you'll find a lot of events happening you'll find a lot of people your age um, you know a lot of young professionals from maybe possibly from the same state or city that you're from. So pretty much anywhere you go in the U.S., except for like very super rural areas, in a lot of the bigger cities, you'll find a very good community to connect with. You know, so the lonely, I wouldn't say the, you know, loneliness is a very strong word. And I don't think uh, that's as common. Um there may be a culture shock, you know, for many people, there may be a culture shock initially. There are things you adjust to, but I've seen so many people who come from India and from different parts for the very first time stepping out of India, but then they are able to get the assistance, support, and the help they need from the community, you know, to adjust. And obviously seeking help. Anytime you feel like you're, you're having, you know, difficulty, you should always reach out to the community for help. And obviously one of the other disadvantages would be you know, kind of obviously adapting to many different ways of 
uh, living, right? In terms of the bills you have to pay, taxes and whatnot, all that stuff will be kind of new. It will be maybe different from India. You might be paying a different amount in taxes. <clears throat> so stuff like that uh, essentially will be different. So, you know, um, what are the disadvantages? That's generally it, honestly. You know, healthcare is expensive in the U.S., so you make sure you have insurance. Um, but generally, as I said, in most big cities, you will have a good community of Indians, of people from your state, likely. And you will, it may take some time to adjust, but eventually you'll kind of get into the groove. Yeah, but I would just mention more specifically, you know, when we say um, GPA or your medical school scores, what I have to say is if you're an IMG or you did medical school outside the U.S., programs don't take that as seriously as they take the U.S. medical school scores because foreign medical schools, they all have different ways of assessing people. You know, they have different scoring systems. They have everything is different there's nothing standardized so it's difficult for programs to d depend on that you know um so grades generally do not they're not of incredible importance but one thing they look at is your percentile ranking so they look at your scores in relation to the scores of your peers or your colleagues right that is maybe gives a better uh a better insight into how you did academically at your medical school so if you say you were at the 90th percentile in your medical school it means you were like at the 90th percentile among all your colleagues um, so the relative ranking relative scoring is of more value than just like a an absolute score but generally a, you know step scores will always trump uh, a GPA but it, it always helps to demonstrate that you were on the Dean's list had a high score or you, you graduate summa cum laude and stuff like that. All right, so uh, Hasi has asked, uh, could you brief about the word work atmosphere in the US? Good question. I would say generally speaking, and that's one of the biggest things I noticed is things in the US at work even are much more casual than how they are in India or many other countries. You know, like in many of our countries, Things are much more formal. You can't even look the faculty in the eye, and they, you know there's all these traditions. That's not the case here. You'll see many of your senior uh, physicians or attending consultants. They'll, you know, they'll uh, mention themselves or they introduce themselves by the uh, by their first name. You know, they'll be like, "Hey, I'm John." Uh, so things are much more casual. Things are much more open in terms of you know interaction, communication. There isn't much of that much of a toxic hierarchy as we may see in many of our countries, right? Um, and it it is not surprising. It is not new for to see like a junior resident or even a medical student teaching others uh, new stuff. So that's the first thing. Things are probably much more friendlier, uh, more casual, and I think Americans generally are thought to be pretty casual it's easy going generally speaking so i think that is a big highlight of just working in the u.s uh rohit says is it necessary to have one year of research experience to match in top tier programs like harvard yale john hopkins and mayo clinic the answer is no it is not necessary um unless you are aiming for you know very competitive specialties so some people do many years of uh research like if you want to do neurosurgery plastic surgery their mean number of publications of uh, applicants who matched into those specialties is like 30 publications 40 50 publications which is insane so for that you need to do research for several years right but if you're applying for internal medicine and stuff like that you do not need to do a year i didn't do a year of uh, research i had research experience as, as a medical student in the summer i came to mayo rochester for like five weeks basically um but i did not have a year of research so it is not compulsory but it helps you know get publications build some connections and so on at a certain uh, institution and and if you're applying to competitive specialties right yeah so i think uh, we're done with the question um yeah 
I see so, this comment uh, by professional development uh, about my Instagram. I have an Instagram. I have it deactivated for now. I, I was posting, you know, advice and posts and stuff like that. For now, I'm off of it, but I'm still going to share it. It's, you know, Dr. Dash Bakal, uh, Dr. Dodd Bakal, actually. Um, you can check back maybe in a week or two. It might be back on. Um, but I have my YouTube channel always there. You know, reach out to me through email, any other um, platform, Twitter, uh, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Right. Uh, I also shared uh, your YouTube channel link mm -hmm. on the WhatsApp group. So everyone, you should just check that out. And mm -hmm. before leaving the call, you can you just wait a second because I would have to send the post event form for you all to fill. Okay. So. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll address this last question Hasti mentioned. So if you have multiple interviews, do you travel to many different places? Now, the key thing is for the past two years, we've had virtual interviews. So I had virtual interviews. I did not have to travel to any, uh, you know, places. But yes, pre-COVID, people would travel to different interviews. And that was one way which limited the number of interviews people were doing, right? Because... The issue we had with virtual interviews is many people were holding interviews. They were keeping all their interviews and not giving them away if they're not interested in the program. But for virtual interviews, we didn't have to travel and we saved a lot of money on accommodation, on flights. Um, so we had virtual interviews last year, virtual interviews this year. Who knows? I don't know if they're going to stick to virtual interviews or they're going to go back to in-person interviews after COVID, but it'll be interesting to see. So, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, I think we're done with all the questions. And if people might have them, uh, they, you know, it's like everything is on the YouTube channel because, you know, it's most of it, uh, of what, of what the questions were, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, you know, you have like complete videos about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm more than happy to answer any time. And thank you, Adnan, for your efforts. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It was okay. fun talking to you guys. And I wish you guys the very best. Thank you so much. Take care, Adnan. And uh, yeah, so everyone just have to fill the form and then leave the meeting. So that would be great. Thank you so much. So I know this is uh, like, it's, uh, might be 9 o'clock for you in the morning. Yeah, it is, pretty much. It's close to 9, 8.30. Right. So much, it's, you know. I just thought that this would be only for you, but still, for taking all the time, this means a lot. No worries, my pleasure always. Take care, and then take care, guys.